This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you want to pre-order Wilds of Eldraine, you can use my link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and it's that time again, set review season. The full card gallery for Wilds of Eldraine went up earlier today, and that means I will now be reviewing every single card in the set over the next week or so to get you ready to play this new limited format at your pre-release or on Magic Arena. We're starting today with a look at the multicolored and colorless cards. Multicolored cards are always a nice place to start because it gives us a better idea of what the format's archetypes and themes are. And it also means we get to start by looking at some of the more powerful, splashy cards in the set, which is always fun. For each of these cards, I'll discuss how I think they will play in Limited, and I'll sum up my thoughts by using a letter grade. If you're new to my set reviews, you can find out what my grades mean by looking in the description. A couple of things to keep in mind as we look at these cards. First, I'm only evaluating these for play in Limited and not any other formats. And that means we're only looking at cards from draft boosters. Additionally, these are my evaluations of these cards before playing the format, so I of course won't be right about everything. I will be providing updates about the format here on the channel as I play it more and more. Lastly, I want to let you know that I'm offering some set review related perks for both patrons and channel members. You get access to my ongoing notes during preview season, and by the end of the set review you'll have a spreadsheet with all of my grades. If those perks sound interesting to you and you want to help support the channel, you can find ways to become a channel member or a patron in the description. All right, without further ado, let's take a look at the first card in my Wilds of Eldraine limited set review. That first card is Agatha of the Vile Cauldron. For a red and a green, she's a 1-1 legendary human warlock at mythic rare. Activated abilities of creatures you control cost X less to activate, where X is Agatha of the Vile Cauldron's power. This effect can't reduce the mana in that cost to less than one mana, and she has an activated ability that costs four generic, a red, and a green. Other creatures you control get plus one plus one and gain trample and haste until end of turn. A two mana one one that reduces the cost of creature activated abilities by one is not that exciting and limited. Sure, there are abilities around, but not so many that you can count on Agatha being a key player in your deck. The cool thing is she does count herself, so her ability will basically cost 5 at the most, and that ability is a pretty awesome overrun effect. Obviously if you augment her power, like with roll tokens or other means, you can gain access to that ability even more quickly. But I think most of her value is just going to come from her ability to make her own ability cost less. And you won't find yourself making the activated abilities of creatures you control cheaper all that often. I'm giving her a C+. Next up, it's the Apprentice's Folly, which for two generic, a blue and a red, is a rare enchantment saga. Like with all sagas, when this enters the battlefield, it does so with a lore counter and you get the chapter one effect. Then after your next two draw steps, in this case, you get the chapter two and then the chapter three effect. Chapter one and two are the same here. It says choose target non-token creature you control that doesn't have the same name as a token you control. Create a token that's a copy of it, except it isn't legendary, is a reflection in addition to its other types, and has haste. And chapter three says sacrifice all reflections you control. So those first two chapters can deliver some pretty absurd value, as making a hasty token copy of your best and then second best creature can be a pretty serious beating. Keep in mind you do need at least two non-token creatures to fully take advantage of chapter one and two because you can't copy something that you already have a token of. Haste means that first copy is even going to attack twice, but there is some bad news here. First of all, you need to have a board that's decently developed enough that you can really go crazy with chapter one and two, because if you're making a copy of like a 2-2, it's really not going to be very exciting. It's not terrible, but it's definitely not that powerful either. And then the other downside is chapter three gets rid of all of your reflections. So in other words, this doesn't really add permanently to the board most of the time. You'll get a couple tokens, one for two turns, one for one turn, and then they're all gone. The good news, though, is that there's a mechanic in this format called Bargain that appears on a lot of cards. Weirdly, I don't think we're going to see it at all in this video, so I'll put a card with Bargain on the screen when I'm editing this. It allows you to sacrifice an enchantment or token or artifact to get a bonus effect, and so if you can sacrifice this after you get Chapter 2, you do keep those tokens forever, and that's not going to be completely far-fetched. There are lots of cards in both red and blue that have bargain. So if you can set that up, this is going to feel really good, especially if you had decent creatures in play to make copies of. If you can't set it up, it's not going to feel that great. You kind of have to get full advantage, maybe even just win the game with chapter one and two for it to be worth it if you can't consistently sacrifice it. Still, I think sacrificing it will be easy enough and getting to hold on to those reflections forever will be easy enough that this looks pretty good to me, giving it a B minus. 
Next up, it's Ash Party Crasher, which for a red and a white is a 2-2 legendary human peasant at Uncommon. It's got haste and it has celebration. This is a new ability word in the set. It means if two or more non-land permanents enter the battlefield under your control this turn, something happens. And in this case, when Ash attacks, she checks to see if those two or more non-land permanents have entered the battlefield under your control this turn. And if they have, she gets a plus and plus one counter. A two minute two two with haste is a solid starting point and getting a plus and plus one counter or two on Ash is pretty doable. You can get celebration going relatively often in red and white with cards that make monster roll auras, cards that make food, or cards that make creature tokens all doing the job. It definitely isn't automatic to get Celebration going. You're not going to be triggering it every single turn, but because Ash gets a permanent boost when you do manage to trigger it, she seems pretty good. She's probably not the kind of signpost uncommon that really pulls you into the deck, though, and for that reason, I'm going to give her a C+. Next up, it's Ariette of the Charmed Apple, which for one generic, a white and a black, is a 2-4 legendary human warlock at Mythic Rare. Each creature that's enchanted by an aura you control can't attack you or planeswalkers you control. At the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses X life and you gain X life, where X is the number of auras you control. That first ability is pretty weird. Basically, you can put monster rolls, these are token auras that we'll talk a little bit more about, I think, on the next card. So you can generate one of these monster rolls and put it on your opponent's thing to make it so it can't attack you or planeswalkers you control. You could put other auras on them too. But the awkward thing about that is these creatures are still going to be able to block. So the idea of putting those sorts of things on them isn't exactly appealing. I mean, there will be situations where that's what you wanna do. You just want to keep something from attacking you, but it also probably means you're not going to be able to attack as effectively yourself. Plus, it's not like Ariette is invulnerable, so if they ever do kill her, they just get a buff out of the aura you put on it. There are some negative auras in the set, including one of the roll tokens, and this does sort of upgrade those because you want to put them on your opponent's stuff anyway. But overall, that first ability doesn't seem like it's going to matter all that much in Limited. The second ability is where you get most of the value here. There are a lot of auras in this set, again, including those roll tokens. And that means draining your opponent one or two life every instep is kind of a reasonable thing to expect, especially in black-white, a deck that's really going to be about monster roll auras. Overall, I think that makes Ariette a B. Next up, it's Fawn's Bane Troll, which for two generic, a black and a green is a 4-4 troll at rare. When it enters the battlefield, you create a monster roll token attached to it. You can see the roll token to the right here. There are seven of these in the set. Six of them offer a bonus to your creature, and one of them is negative. This one gives plus one, plus one, and trample. You can also pay one generic and sacrifice an aura attached to Fawn's Bane Troll, and then it fights target creature you don't control. If that creature would die this turn, exile it. Instead, activate only as a sorcery. This looks great. It's effectively a four mana five five with trample, something that will give your opponent pause on most boards, and it comes with the ability to shed the roll that's attached to it to fight something. As a four four, the troll is likely to be able to take something down on most board states. You can even wait to play it on five, in which case it will often feel like a five mana four four that just kills something, and that's really strong. If you can get more auras on the troll, something that is very doable in this format, it can even do it more than once, at which point it will feel truly absurd. So if you're ahead, you probably keep this around as a 5-5 trampler that just rumbles, and if you're behind, you turn it into removal. Both of those situations are great, and I think it's enough for this to reach into the lower bomb range, I'm giving it an A-. Next up, it's the Goose Mother, which for an X, a green, and a blue is a 2-2 legendary bird Hydra at rare. It's got flying. It enters the battlefield with X plus and plus one counters on it. When it enters the battlefield, you create half X food tokens rounded up, and whenever the Goose Mother attacks, you may sacrifice a food if you do draw a card. This set's pretty awesome for me because it has rats, mice, and geese in it, which are all animals I'm a pretty big fan of. Anyway, the Goose Mother looks amazing. It isn't quite Hydroid Crassus, but it does a pretty good impression. It scales all game long and becomes even more of a flying threat. That also pumps out an increasingly impressive amount of food tokens, which you can use not only to gain life, but also to throw away to draw cards with the Goose Mother. As long as you pay at least two for X, the Goose Mother is always going to give you some permanent value and a very efficient body. And if it's left unchecked, it's going to draw you a ton of cards too. This is a huge bomb. I'm giving it an A+. Next up, it's Greta, Sweet Tooth Scourge, which for one generic, a black and a green, is a 3-3 legendary human warrior at Uncommon. When it enters a battlefield, you create a food token. You can pay one and sacrifice a food to put a plus and plus one counter on target creature, activate only as a sorcery, and you can pay one generic and a black and sacrifice a food to draw a card and you lose one life. So this is black, green, signpost Uncommon. Obviously enough, it's all about food. A three mana 3-3 three, three that makes a food is already something I would always play, so her other abilities are amazing. 
Giving up foods for cards is an especially good deal, and sometimes buffing your creatures with food is nice too. Keep in mind that the buff effect is only sorcery speed, while the draw a card effect is not. In the later stage of the game, you can look at this as a 5-mana 3-3 that draws you a card and you lose one life, which isn't too bad either. This looks like an excellent signpost uncommon overall, with a great baseline and a very powerful effect on the game. I'm giving it a B+. Next up, it's Hilda of the Icy Crown, which for two generic, a white and a blue, is a 3-4 legendary human warlock at Mythic Rare. Whenever you tap an untapped creature an opponent controls, you can pay one generic, and when you do, you choose one. Create a 4-4 white and blue elemental creature token, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control, scry two, then draw a card. Stun counters and tapping are featured fairly heavily in this set, including on the blue-white signpost uncommon, which we haven't seen yet, so actually getting these abilities going is doable, and you'll have to because otherwise this is just a hard to cast 4 mana 3-4. I do think she probably needs a build around grade because even your typical blue-white deck isn't going to have so many tap effects for this to really get going. Although I guess even if you have like two of them, you're going to feel pretty good about playing her as triggering her even only once is more than enough for her to feel amazing. Buffing your whole board or getting a huge creature token is going to feel awesome. Still, she's probably a C plus in your typical blue-white deck, but a straight up bomb in A in a blue-white deck that gets there on tap effects. Like if you have five or six, she's just going to be crazy. Next up, it's Johan Apprentice Sorcerer, which for two generic, a blue and a red is a 2-5 legendary human wizard and uncommon. You may look at the top card of your library any time. Once each turn, you may cast an instant or sorcery spell from the top of your library. So blue-red is about spells, as it often is. This effect is really powerful, even when limited to once per turn. If your deck has enough instants and sorceries in it, this will end up drawing you an extra card on many turns, and that's just crazy. This gets even better if you use draw effects or other things to manipulate the top of your library, as you increase your chances of getting that card on top. Having high toughness is nice too, as it means Johan is an engine that isn't super easy to kill. I'm giving him a B-. Next up, it's Likeness Looter, which for a blue and a black is a 1-1 fairy shapeshifter at rare. It's got flying, and you can tap it to loot, of course, which means draw a card, then discard a card, and you can pay X, and it becomes a copy of target creature card in your graveyard with mana value X, except it has flying and this ability. Activate only as a sorcery. A 2-mana 1-1 with flying that can tap to loot is probably pretty close to a B-. Looting for free just always plays amazingly well in Limited, so this added upside of turning into a copy of creatures in your graveyard is pretty amazing, especially because it holds on to flying. This gets really close to being a bomb for me, but because it takes some time to really generate value, it is probably held to a B+. Next up, it's Neva Stalked by Nightmares, which for two generic, a white and a black, is a 2-2 legendary human noble at Uncommon, it has Menace. And when it enters the battlefield, you return target creature or enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. Whenever an enchantment you control is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, put a plus and plus one counter on Neva, then scry one. A Gravedigger with Menace that can also get back enchantments is a card I'd already play, and this also can get quite large. Keep in mind, anytime you put a roll on a creature that already has one, it loses the one it had before, so that's one of the ways in this format that you can make Neva grow. You can also do stuff with Bargain, which lets you sacrifice enchantments to make Neva grow. I do think it's worth noting, even in this format that has some built-in ways to get enchantments into the graveyard, it's not going to be that easy or efficient to grow Neva. I think most of her value just comes from her Into the Battlefield ability. But she does have this long game upside where she can really become a threat. Overall, she looks like a really good signpost uncommon. Obviously, Black White is about enchantments in the graveyard, I'm giving her a B. Next up, it's Obira Dreaming Duelist, which for a blue and a black is a 2-2 legendary fairy warrior at Uncommon. It's got flash and flying. Whenever another fairy enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life. A 2-mana 2-2 with flash and flying will always make the cut, so the fact that this will also chip in and make your opponent lose life while you play out your other fairies is nice, especially because so many fairies are evasive that chipping in for one damage here and there makes it a lot easier for you to do lethal. Obviously enough, blue-black is all about fairies in this format. I'm giving this a B. Next up, it's Rowan, Scion of War, which for one generic, a black and a red, is a 4-2 legendary human wizard at Mythic Rare. It's got Menace, and you can tap it, and spells you cast this turn that are black and or red cost X less to cast, where X is the amount of life you lost this turn. Activate only as a sorcery. A 3-mana 4-2 with Menace is a pretty good starting point. That's probably a C+. So how much extra value does this ability give you? Well... Not much. Paying life is around in the format, but it isn't a huge theme, and you need to both pay life and have a card when it matters that you can reduce the cost of. 
Additionally, the fact it's only sorcery speed means you can't use this after your opponent damages you on their turn or something and then reduce the cost of an instant. So mostly what we're talking about here is a three mana four two with menace. I think that card's probably a C plus. Every now and then you'll get a little bit more of a bonus out of it, but most of the time we're just talking about this as a French vanilla creature. Next up, it's Ruby Daring Tracker, which for a red and a green is a 1-2 legendary human scout at Uncommon. It's got haste, and when it attacks, while you control a creature with power 4 or greater, Ruby gets plus 2, plus 2 until end of turn, and she can tap for a red or green mana. This is another nice signpost Uncommon. Obviously, red-green is about ramping and big creatures. This can ramp your mana quite effectively, and that makes it more likely that you can get out a creature with power 4 or greater pretty quickly, at which point Ruby herself becomes a significantly better attacker. There will also be times in the mid to late game when you draw her and you can already trigger this ability, in which case she becomes a 2-mana 3-4 with haste, which is going to feel pretty good, giving her a B-. Next up, it's Charay of Numbing Depths, which for two generic, a white and a blue, is a 2-3 legendary merfolk wizard at Uncommon. When it enters a battlefield, tap target creature an opponent controls and put a stun counter on it. Whenever you tap one or more untapped creatures your opponents control, draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. I like this a lot, all on its own. It's a 4-mana 2-3 that stuns something and draws you a card, basically. I'm always playing that. You know, stunning isn't quite as good as bouncing, but it feels pretty close in many situations. And obviously it works really well if you have other tap effects. It does feel to me like the blue-white deck, it's sort of supposed to be built around tapping things, but I'm not sure how well that's going to pan out in practice. But the good news is a card like Sheree doesn't really need you to have other ways to tap things to be really good. She's going to be good all on her own. And overall, I think she's a B. Next up, it's Sir Armont, the Redeemer, which for three generic, a green and a white, is a 4-4 legendary human knight at Uncommon. When she enters the battlefield, you create a monster roll token attached to another target creature you control, and enchanted creatures you control get plus one, plus one. This looks amazing. It can't put the roll on itself, but provided you have something else around, Sir Armont is a five mana 4-4 four, four that gives something else plus two, plus two, and trample, and uh, that's pretty crazy, and will usually mean that whatever you just put that roll on is suddenly a way more effective attacker than it was before. Sometimes it will turn something that couldn't attack at all into an attacker, and I haven't even mentioned how good this effect is when you have other rolls and other auras around on your board. I think this is an amazing signpost uncommon. Obviously, green-white is really into enchantments and roll tokens. I'm giving this one a B+. Next up, it's Talion the Kindly Lord, which for two generic, a blue and a black, is a 3-4 legendary fairy noble at Mythic Rare. It's got flying, and when it enters the battlefield, you choose a number between 1 and 10. Whenever an opponent casts a spell with mana value, power, or toughness equal to the chosen number, that player loses two life, and you draw a card. This has a really cool design, and I think it's also really good. A 4-mana 3-4 flyer is a good starting point, and if you can get the ability to trigger even once, Talion will feel completely insane. Now, you won't always be able to make that happen, but if you choose 2, for example, there's a pretty good chance Talion will get triggered at some point. If you have information about your opponent's hand, it gets even better, but yeah, we're talking about a great baseline and a completely insane ceiling. I think you'll be able to trigger the choose a number effect often enough for Talion to be quite good. I'm giving it a B plus. Next up, it's Toten Taunt's Swarm Piper, which for one generic, a red and a black is a 2-3 legendary human warlock bard at Uncommon. Whenever it or another non-token creature you control dies, create a 1-1 black rat creature token with, this creature can't block, and you can pay one generic and a black and target attacking rat you control gains death touch until end of turn. As usual, Black Red is into making your own things die, whether as a result of sacrificing them or otherwise. On its own, Totentance is a 3-mana 2-3 that leaves it behind a 1-1 one, one that can't block. That's an okay card, and the fact that Totentance can potentially become a rat engine is pretty exciting. Giving those rats death touch is pretty nice too, because oftentimes your opponent's just going to want to chump block them, but that becomes basically impossible if you attack with a rat and leave mana up from Totentance. There are a decent number of rats in the format too, other than the ones that Totentance is going to make. So it looks like there's so much synergy in black red for getting these extra bodies, for getting rat tokens, that Totentance is gonna be a pretty strong signpost in common. I'm giving it a B. Next up, it's Troyon Gutsy Explorer, which for one generic, a green and a blue, is a 1-3 legendary Vidalkin Scout at Uncommon. You can tap it for a green and a blue, spend this mana only to cast spells with mana value 5 or greater, or spells with X in their mana costs, and you can pay one blue and tap it to loot. Draw a card, then discard a card. Playing this on turn 3 will often let you power out a 5 or even 6 drop on turn 4, which is pretty awesome. The loot effect is really nice too, because it means when you don't have something to power out with the mana Troyon produces, 
you can start digging for exactly that. And looting for one mana is a pretty nice effect in Limited. Anyway, he does have underwhelming stats, and sometimes you're gonna find yourself in a situation where you just don't have anything to ramp into, and the fact that its stats are so bad are really gonna stand out. But overall, I still think this is a B. Next up, it's Will, Scion of Peace, which for one generic, a blue and a white, is a 2-4 legendary human wizard at Mythic Rare. It has Vigilance, and you can tap it, and spells you cast this turn that are white and or blue cost X less to cast, where X is the amount of life you gained this turn. Activate only as a sorcery. This has decent base stats, and there are some ways to make this ability do something, most notably food, but it doesn't really feel to me like things will line up consistently enough for Will to do anything special. You have to both gain life and have something where decreasing the cost actually matters, and that won't line up all that often. So I think Will is just a C+. Next up, it's Yenna, Red Tooth Regent, which for two generic, a green and a white, is a 4-4 legendary elf noble at rare. You can pay two and tap it, and it says choose target enchantment you control that doesn't have the same name as another permanent you control. Create a token that's a copy of it, except it isn't legendary. If the token is an aura, untap Yenna, Red Tooth Regent, then scry two, activate only as a sorcery. She has solid base stats and comes with the ability to duplicate enchantments in a set with lots of enchantments. That's pretty amazing, especially because if you copy auras, like roll tokens, she'll untap and let you do it again, potentially. There seems to be plenty for her to copy in this set, so I think she's a B+. All right, now we're moving into the multicolored adventures. The first of these is Baluna Grand Squaw, which costs a green, a blue, and a red for a 4-4 legendary giant noble at Mythic Rare. It has Trample, permanent spells you cast that have an adventure cost one less to cast, and it has an adventure. So when you cast the adventure side of a creature, the card gets exiled and then later, or on the same turn if you happen to have the mana, you can cast that creature from exile. You can always just cast the creature first if you want to. You don't have to do the adventure thing first. So in this case, the adventure is Seek Thrills, which for two generic, a green, a blue, and a red is an instant adventure. It says mill seven cards, then put all cards that have an adventure from among the milled cards into your hand. So. In Limited, the best part of this is probably just the creature side. The adventure can maybe draw you a couple of cards, but it's expensive enough and random enough that I don't love it. I do like the idea of an efficient 4-4 trampler that will reduce the cost of many cards. Being three different colors definitely makes it more of a challenge to get Baluna going in the right situation, though. So I think this is just a C+. Next up, we have Callus Cell Sword, which for one generic and a black is a 2 2 human soldier at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, it does so with a plus and plus one counter on it for each creature that died under your control this turn. The adventure in this case costs one red and it's a sorcery. And it says target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to any other target, then sacrifice it. The adventure side of this is often not going to be very good since you two for one yourself. It's basically a worse version of Bone Splinters in most ways, and it isn't like Bone Splinters is an amazing card. It does have the upside of letting you sort of fling your creature at something too because you sacrifice your creature. So if you have a creature with really high power and you can fling it at your opponent to beat them, obviously that's gonna feel pretty good. And that is upside this card has in addition to just being a two mana two two that already has upside. But this is probably a case where you frequently just don't cast the adventure before you cast the Cell Sword. They do synergize with each other, and most of these adventures do, because if you sacrifice something and then play the Cell Sword, it'll enter with a plus and plus one counter on it. But there are going to be lots of situations where it's really not worth doing it that way. I'll also say that we've seen a lot of creatures like this over the years that enter with counters on them for each creature you control that died in a turn, and they're a lot harder to line up effectively than you would think. Getting one counter on them is even pretty hard, so at least with Burn Together here, you can make that happen a decent chunk of the time. But this is just going to be a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two a lot of the time, and then the other side of it's really not going to be that effective except in very specific situations. Overall, I think that means a Cell Sword is just a C. That's a pretty low grade because as we're going to see, most of these adventures are significantly better than this. The next one is Cruel Somnifage, which for one generic and a black is a rare nightmare. It's a star star, and its power and toughness are each equal to the number of creature cards in all graveyards. It has an adventure called Can't Wake Up for one generic and a blue. It's a sorcery, and target player mills four cards. So if this didn't have an adventure attached, it would probably be borderline playable. There will be times where it's big, but a two drop that you probably can't play on turn two isn't exactly ideal, and the upside is still just a huge vanilla creature. However, having the adventure here definitely matters, as it helps set up the Somnophage a lot more effectively. Milling yourself or your opponent is a pretty decent effect to have in this format, too. 
Still, there will be times where this is very awkward and the upside isn't exactly through the roof. I'm giving this a C+. Next up, it's Decadent Dragon, which for two generic and two black is a 4-4 dragon at rare. It's got flying and trample. When it attacks, you create a treasure token. Its adventure is Expensive Taste, which for two generic and a black is an instant adventure. And it says, exile the top two cards of target opponent's library face down. You may look at and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled. A four mana 4-4 four, four with flying and trample that spits out a treasure is already an excellent card, like a B+. So the fact that you can cast this as an adventure at some point too is great, especially because it's a really strong one. It's kind of an instant speed divination effect because you pay three and you net two cards. And when you have time to cast both halves, this can generate something like a three for one. The one downside about expensive tastes is that if you hit cards that you can't cast normally because you're not in those colors, you are reliant on having treasure from something like the dragon to actually cast those things. But either way, this gives you a way to get a couple of extra cards on one turn, and then on the next turn, you end up playing out a dragon that is incredibly powerful, and if your opponent doesn't kill it, they probably lose. So the total package here is a bomb. I'm giving it an A. Next up, it's Devouring Sugar Maw, which for two generic and two black is a rare horror. It's a 6-6 six, six with Menace and Trample. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may sacrifice an artifact, enchantment, or token. If you don't, tap Devouring Sugar Maw. And it has an adventure called Have for Dinner for one generic and a white, which is an instant, and it makes a 1-1 one, one white human creature token and a food token. If you can keep this around, it's a pretty scary creature. Luckily, it doesn't seem that hard to keep around in the format, especially because of its adventure, which will give you two pieces of sacrifice fodder. I mean, on its own, Have for Dinner is probably a playable card in the format anyway, so having the upside of playing a huge, hard-to-block creature is awesome. And yeah, there's plenty of additional fodder in the format, too. You can still run out of things to sacrifice, of course, and you may end up in a spot where you just can't really keep Sugar Maw untapped, and when that happens, it's going to feel kind of miserable, but it still seems pretty good to me. I'm giving it a B-. Next up, it's Elusive Otter, which for one blue mana is a rare creature otter. It's a 1-1 one -one with prowess, and creatures with power less than Elusive Otter's power can't block it. Its adventure is called Grove's Bounty. It's X and a green for a sorcery. And it says distribute X plus one plus one counters among any number of target creatures you control. Each side of this would be a playable card all on its own. So stapling them together is pretty awesome. If you need a one drop, Elusive Otter can do the job pretty well. And if you draw it late, you can put a bunch of counters on your stuff first. I'm giving this a B plus. Next up, it's Frolicking Familiar, which for two generic and a blue is a 2-2 Otter Wizard at Uncommon. It's got flying. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, Frolicking Familiar gets plus one plus one until end of turn, and it has an adventure called Blow Off Steam, which is a one red mana instant that does one damage to any target. This looks great. You'll often be able to pick off something small with the adventure, and that means you're talking about a potential two for one, and then you get a 2-2 flyer that can become a real problem as an attacker, especially when you leave your mana up because your opponent has no idea exactly how big the familiar can get. This is a very nice uncommon. I'm giving it a B. Next up, it's Gingerbread Hunter, which for four generic and a black is a 5-5 five, five giant at Uncommon. When it enters a battlefield, you create a food token, and its adventure is called Puny Snack. It's two generic and a black for an instant, and it says target creature gets minus two, minus two until end of turn. This is also a very strong adventure creature. Sure, Puny Snack isn't the best removal spell in the world, but when it's attached to an efficient creature who also spits out a food token doesn't really matter. That's kind of the thing with a lot of these adventures. If you can look at each half and say, okay, I can probably deal with one card by doing that, you're getting a ton of value out of one card. And this is one of those. Generating a two for one here is very easy. Then it's a huge creature that can gain you life. That's the kind of thing that can really help you stabilize against faster decks. This looks like one of the better uncommons in the set to me. I'm giving it a B plus. Next up, it's Heart Flame Duelist, which for one generic and a red is a 3-1 Human Knight at rare. Instant and sorcery spells you control have lifelink. It's a 3-1. And its adventure is called Heart Flame Slash. And for two generic and a red, it's an instant adventure. And it deals three damage to any target. So this is a lot like the Gingerbread Hunter we just looked at. It's removal on one side, and that's amazing. And in this case, the removal is far more efficient. You would never cut a card that is always Heart Flame Slash from your deck, which means, by the way, you can play this in a deck that has no white mana in it and still be reasonably happy, and that definitely matters. Increases the chance you're going to play it if you first pick this, for example. The other side isn't as imposing as that giant, of course. It's just a two mana three one, but that's a reasonable two drop, and you may actually gain some life thanks to lifelink. And this is another card that can very easily generate a two for one, and it can do it incredibly efficiently. 
I think all of that makes this sneak into the lower bomb range. I'm giving it an A minus. Next up, it's Imodane's Recruiter, which for two generic and a red is a 2-2 uncommon. And when it enters the battlefield, creatures you control get plus one plus zero and gain haste until end of turn. And he has an adventure called Train Troops, which is a sorcery for four generic and a white. And it makes two 2-2 two, two white knight creature tokens with vigilance. The creature side is effectively a three mana 3-2 with haste that also buffs the rest of your board. That's a pretty good card. The adventure side isn't the most efficient way to produce a couple of knight tokens, but like with all adventures, having that option at all is a big deal. I mean, if you have the time to cast both sides, getting a three for one isn't impossible here. And if you have eight mana, you can crank out the two two twos and then play the recruiter, which will be really devastating. All that said, this is an adventure creature where you're more likely to wanna to play the creature before you ever get to the adventure. So this isn't one where you'll very consistently be able to generate two cards or three cards worth of value out of it. But it does look like it's going to work quite well, especially in the red-white deck. You know, the adventure side of this can trigger celebration, and you're going to be going wide in that deck anyway, so buffing everything seems pretty good. I'm giving this a B-. Next up, it's Kellan, the Fey blooded which for two generic and a red is a 2-2 legendary human fairy at mythic rare. It has double strike. Other creatures you control get plus one plus zero for each aura and equipment attached to Kellan. And he's got an adventure for one generic and a white. It's a sorcery. So search your library for an aura or equipment card, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle. A 3-mana 2-2 Double Strike is a card you always play that's probably like a B, and this comes with some nice upside in a format with built-in auras in the form of the roll tokens. The tutor side of the card is pretty bad on its own. You know, I talk about all the time how bad just straight-up tutors tend to be in limited, especially when they're this restricted. But when you add a tutor onto something that does actually add to the board, and that's exactly what you have here, it becomes significantly better. There are enough auras in this set for sure for some of them to be worth tutoring up. There aren't that many very good equipment in the set though. So that ability really isn't gonna be that good even in a world where you have it attached to a creature. Now putting a roll token on Kellan is incredibly strong just because he already has double strike which makes every buff kind of insane but also because it means the rest of your board will be buffed too. And so I think that effect does definitely matter. There's lots of those roll tokens around in the format. So overall, I think he's pretty good. The adventure side's kind of underwhelming. You're getting most of the value here out of his creature side, but the creature side's good enough that this is a B plus. Next up, it's Mosswood Dread Knight, which for one generic into green is a 3-2 human knight at rare. It has trample. When Mosswood Dread Knight dies, you may cast it from your graveyard as an adventure until the end of your next turn. And it has an adventure built in already for one generic into black. It's a sorcery. It says you draw a card and you lose one life. So the adventure here gives you a full card and the creature side usually will too. Based on what I've already said about all of these adventures, you know this is a really good one because it has a built-in two for one. And it could get even better than that because when it dies, you have the ability to cast Dread Whispers all over again. And that's gonna result in a three for one. So there's just all kinds of insane value here. You do need the time and you do need the mana to get that full value. But one of the really cool things about the Dread Knight is you can play it on turn two before you ever cast it as an adventure, like if you just wanna have a 3-2 trampling beater down on turn two that can do some significant damage, you can just do that, and then when it dies, you still get the adventure. So you can do it in the backwards order thanks to its ability. So it's pretty hard for you not to get at least a two for one out of this, and getting a three for one out of it isn't entirely out of the question. It just seems like this delivers so much value so efficiently that it's probably a bomb. I'm giving it an A minus. Next up, it's Picnic Ruiner, which for one generic and a red is an uncommon goblin rogue. It's a 2-2, and when it attacks while you control a creature with power four or greater, it gains double strike until end of turn. It has an adventure called Stolen Goodies, which is three generic and a green for a sorcery. Distribute three plus and plus one counters among any number target of creatures you control. So this is a two mana 2-2 two -two with a bunch of upside. When it has a big enough friend around, it becomes a much more intimidating attacker. I mean, a 2-2 two -two double striker matters on virtually any board, and that alone is enough for the Ruiner to be relevant almost all game long. This is a case where I think you probably play this as a two drop when you have it on turn two, because while the adventure is definitely a nice bit of value to have, making sure you get it isn't that important because it's not the kind of adventure that will generate like a card worth the value all on its own. Obviously, like a lot of these, it is fun how it synergizes with itself as Stolen Goodies is likely to make one of your creatures have four or more power so that the Ruiner can do its thing. Basically, if you draw this later, you'll probably cast both halves, but if you have it early, you're probably just gonna play it as a creature, but it's a pretty nice two drop. And all of these different options sound good to me, giving it a B minus. Next up, it's Pollen Shield Hair, which for one generic into white is a 2-2 two -two rabbit at rare. 
Preacher tokens you control get plus one plus one. You can pay one green for an adventure. In this case, it's a sorcery. It's called hair raising, and it says target creature you control gains vigilance and gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control. There are definitely creature tokens in this format. Plenty of them, actually. If you happen to be like a white, black, or white, red deck, you have access to a bunch of rats, for example. But even in green, white, you're going to have access to a decent number of creature tokens. So that upside does matter. But both sides of this have like a really high ceiling that you're probably not going to meet all that often, but they are both pretty good even in medium situations. You know, a two mana two two is always okay. And even if you're only giving like plus two plus two and vigilance to something that you're attacking with, with hair raising, that's gonna feel pretty good too. I mean, you can look at this, like a lot of these, especially when they're cheap and you can consistently pay both halves in a single turn, it's not that hard to look at this as a three mana two two with the hair raising side as an enter the battlefield ability. And that would be a pretty good card. And I think that means this is a pretty good card, giving it a B. Next up, it's Questing Druid, which for one generic into green is a 1-1 one, one human druid at rare. Whenever you cast a spell that's white, blue, black, or red, put a plus one plus one counter on Questing Druid, and it has an adventure called Seek the Beast. It's one generic and a red for an instant. Exile the top two cards of your library. Until your next instep, you may play those cards. This is a fun callback to Quirion Druid. One important thing to note here is that Seek the Beast doesn't give you as much time to play the card as we've seen lately, as you only have until your next instep. Good news is, it's an instant, so you can cast it at the end of your opponent's turn, and then take advantage of those cards you reveal with all the mana you still have. And obviously, if you can play the Druid and then a non-green card on that turn, it's going to feel pretty good. I will say that buffing the Druid isn't really going to be that easy in this format. Sure, a decent chunk of your deck will buff it, but far more of it won't because it either will be green or be lands, and that makes this an extremely unimpressive creature a lot of the time. Still, this has three for one potential and is quite efficient. I'm giving it a B minus. Next up, it's Scalding Viper, which for one generic into red is a 2-1 elemental snake at rare. Whenever an opponent casts a spell with mana value three or less, it deals one damage to that player. And it has an adventure called Steam Clean, which for one generic into blue is a sorcery, and it lets you return a non-land permanent to its owner's hand. While this isn't quite Brazen Borrower, Scalding Viper is pretty good and will feel similar sometimes. After all, it's a creature that can bounce a non-land permanent and then add itself to the board. A two mana 2-1 with the Viper's ability is a pretty nice two drop for limited, as it is reasonably likely to chip in some extra damage, so the fact that this can also bounce something is really nice. I'm giving this a B. Next up, it's Shrouded Shepherd, which for one generic and a white is a 2-2 uncommon spirit warrior. When it enters a battlefield, target creature you control gets plus two plus two until end of turn, and it has an adventure called Cleave Shadows, which for one generic and a black is a sorcery. Creatures your opponents control get minus one, minus one until end of turn. Cleave Shadows is somewhat situational, but I think you'll be surprised by how many board states there will be where it lets you kill something. It does pick off all the rat tokens, for example. And if you're doing that, the Shepherd will feel pretty nuts. You can, of course, also cleave and then cast the creature in the same turn, in which case their debuffed board and your buffed creature probably means you have a pretty great attack. Even without the adventure, Shrouded Shepherd would be playable all on its own. So I think this is another one of these where the total package is really impressive. This is one that can certainly generate a two for one and the baseline is really good. So I think this is a B. Next up, it's Spell Scorn Coven, which for three generic and a black is a two, three fairy warlock at uncommon. It's got flying and when it enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card. It comes with an adventure that's an instant called Take It Back for two generic and a blue, return target spell to its owner's hand. As with most of these, if you take the adventure away, we're talking about a playable card. A four mana two three flyer that forces your opponent to discard is exactly that. And in the earlier part of the game, the fact that this bounces a spell is pretty nice. That effect normally isn't that impressive, mostly because you go down a card for tempo alone, but because you still have the coven to play later, that isn't true in this case. Obviously, these can synergize well together too. You can bounce a spell to your opponent's hand on turn three, then on turn four, play the coven and make them discard the card, potentially. They're generally going to have more than just that one card, so it's not gonna line up perfectly like that. But no matter what, we're talking about a card that gives you a ton of value and tempo, and it's a two for one on its own, just because of its Enter the Battlefield ability. So I think this is another very nice adventure, giving it a B. Next up, it's Tempest Heart, which for three generic and a green is a three, four elemental elk at uncommon. It's got trample. And whenever you cast a spell with mana value five or greater, you put a plus and plus one counter on the heart. And it has an adventure. It's an instant called Scan the Clouds. It costs one generic and a blue. And it says draw two cards, then discard two cards. 
Faithless Looting for two mana is a pretty nice adventure to have. That kind of card selection can be huge, especially if you have nothing else to do on turn two. The creature side of this is decidedly less impressive because it starts out inefficiently and asks you to do something that even in blue-green, you're not going to do so often that the heart will just be absolutely massive. Even in a ramp deck, you can only have so many cards in your deck with a mana value high enough to trigger it. Anyway, all that to say, this is another really good adventure creature. I'm giving it a B-. Next up, it's Threadbind Click, which for three generic and a white is a 3-3 fairy at Uncommon. It has flying, and its adventure is called Rip the Seams. It's an instant that costs two generic and a white, and it destroys a tapped creature. Both sides of this card have been fairly underwhelming when we've seen them lately, like as a card all on its own. Destroying only tapped creatures is highly restrictive and not especially useful when you're the beatdown, but at least it does let you do it at instant speed in this case, so a creature doesn't have to hit you first. Then a four mana 3-3 flyer just isn't what it used to be. You know, it gets outclassed pretty quickly. There's usually one and two mana removal spells that can kill it and hurt you with tempo. But even two medium cards stapled together is two cards, and each of these can take out an opposing card. So this is yet another adventure that gives you a very accessible two for one. It's a B. Next up, it's Twining Twins, which for two generic and two blue is a 4-4 Fairy Wizard at rare. It's got Flying, Vigilance, and Ward 1. Its adventure is an instant called Swift Spiral, which for one generic and a white says, Exile target non-token creature, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. The adventure side of this isn't always going to be useful, but it is more flexible than most versions of this effect we see. It can go after opposing creatures, which means that in addition to helping you blink your own stuff sometimes, you can also use it to temporarily get rid of a blocker. Then the creature side is incredibly imposing and can take over games all on its own. I'm giving this a B+. Next up, it's Woodland Acolyte, which for two generic and a white is a 2-2 human cleric at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card, and its adventure is called Mend the Wilds. It costs one green, and it's an instant, and it says, put target permanent card from your graveyard on top of your library. I would always play a three-mana 2-2 two -two that draws me a card in virtually any format, and this is a lot better than that. Because of the adventure, you can kind of look at it as a four-mana 2-2 two -two that gets you a permanent back into your hand from your graveyard, and that is also a card I would probably play one of most of the time. Even playing this in a deck that can never cast the adventure half sounds pretty good. That's a true of a lot of these, incidentally. But all this means that this is another adventure that can give you a two-for-one. I'm giving it a B. All right, so that's the end of our multicolored cards. We're moving into colorless now starting with Agatha's Soul Cauldron, which costs two generic for a mythic rare legendary artifact. You may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to activate abilities of creatures you control. Creatures you control with plus one plus one counters on them have all activated abilities of all creature cards exiled with Agatha's Soul Cauldron. You can tap it and it says exile target creature card from a graveyard. When a creature card is exiled this way, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. This has a whole lot of text that's not going to come up that often in Limited. There are definitely activated abilities that your creatures can borrow, but most of this card's value comes from its ability to put plus and plus one counters on your board. Sometimes you'll get to do something silly with an activated ability, but that part of the card can't really be counted on. That said, the fact it can go after either graveyard is pretty nice, as it makes it easier and easier for you to get those counters. But this is also a card that's going to be entirely dead for like the first half of the game most of the time, and that's a pretty big problem. It does seem pretty sweet in the late game where you can use it to put a counter on something every turn, and maybe even by that stage you can do some silly things with activated abilities. But it's really slow, really awkward in the early game, so I have a hard time seeing this as more than a C. Next up, it's Candy Trail, which for one generic is a common artifact food clue. When it enters the battlefield, you scry two, and you can pay two and sack it to gain three life and draw a card. Scry two on turn one doesn't sound like a bad idea in a lot of situations, although using up a whole card to do it definitely isn't appealing. However, the fact you can cash this in for a card and life later means you don't really use up a whole card. Still, in a format without a big artifact theme, this sort of trinkety artifact that has a tiny effect seems kind of underwhelming, giving it a D+. Next, it's Collector's Vault, which for two generic is an uncommon artifact. You can pay two and tap it to draw a card, then discard a card and create a treasure token. This is probably too clunky to be worth it. Looting and treasure is nice, of course, but the number of turns where you have the time and mana to activate this ability will be pretty low. I'm giving this a D. Next up, it's Ariette's Tempting Apple, which for four generic is an uncommon legendary artifact food. When it enters the battlefield, you gain control of target creature until end of turn. Untap that creature, it gains haste until end of turn. You can pay two and tap it and sacrifice it to gain three, and you can pay two and tap it and sacrifice it to make your opponent lose three. 
A four mana threaten isn't amazing, but if you can sacrifice the thing you steal, we're talking about something that'll feel pretty good sometimes, but the apple's other two effects aren't particularly good on top of already having spent four mana to play the apple in the first place, especially because there will be so many situations where that into the battlefield ability just doesn't matter. So this is probably just a D. Next up, it's Ginger Brute, which for one generic is a 1-1 artifact creature food golem at common. It's got haste. You can pay one generic and it can't be blocked this turn except by creatures with haste. And for two generic and a tap, you can sack it and gain three life. So this was in the original Eldraine and it was pretty good there. That format had a huge equipment theme that made it pretty good. And while we don't have that here really, we do have a big aura theme and just putting any one of the roll tokens on Ginger Brute is going to be pretty amazing. So I think he'll be similarly good in this format. He also happens to be a food, which matters in some decks, but just as an evasive one drop that can really run away with the game when you buff it, Ginger Brute looks like a pretty good card overall, giving it a C plus. Next up, it's Hilda's Crown of Winter, which for three generic is a rare legendary artifact. You can pay one and tap it to tap a creature. This ability costs one less to activate during your turn. You can pay three and sacrifice it to draw a card for each tapped creature your opponents control. This is a pretty cool Icy Manipulator variant. Like the Manipulator, you can use it to tap an opposing creature on your opponent's turn, and that's generally the more powerful way to use it, because it also means that creature won't be attacking or blocking for an entire turn cycle. It's pretty great that Hilda's Crown can tap things for free when it's your turn, which is generally when the effect is less powerful, so it makes sense. But if you're the beatdown, tapping things down for free on your turn and adding to the board is gonna feel pretty good. This is going to wreak havoc on your opponent and there's no way they can just ignore the crown as a result. And on top of all of that, there are a few cards, especially in blue-white, we saw a couple in this video, that will give you extra value for tapping things. And I also haven't even mentioned the fact that you can use it to draw a bunch of cards if you need to. This gets pretty close to being a bomb, I think. It's sort of gonna feel like removal that you pay one for every turn. And the fact you can pay one at the end of your opponent's turn to tap something and then on your turn tap it for free to tap something else, that kind of thing can really cause serious problems for your opponent. It does get a little less good when you're behind, but even then it can be used to really slow your opponent down, I'm giving this a B plus. Next up, it's the Irin Crag, which for two generic is a rare legendary artifact that can tap for colorless. Whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may have the Irin Crag become a legendary equipment artifact named Everflame Hero's Legacy. If you do, it gains equipped for three generic and equipped creature gets plus three plus three and loses all other abilities. So a two mana artifact that can tap for one colorless is actually pretty reasonable. I mean, we see three mana mana rocks that don't really pan out in limited all the time, but two is a pretty big difference. We almost never see these these days. You know, we don't get Mind Stone-like cards very often. And this is sort of similar to Mind Stone in the sense that, you know, it does the same thing in terms of ramping your mana, and then later in the game it can do something else. There are enough legendary creatures in the set for this to transform into ever flame a decent chunk of the time. All the signpost and commons, for example, are legendary. And I think the ramp it offers you early is enough for this to be pretty solid, I'm giving it a C plus. Next up, it's Prophetic Prism, which for two generic is a common artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card and you can pay one generic and tap it to add one mana of any color. This is pretty solid basically every time we see it. It's really good in some formats, but that's generally formats with a big artifact theme. And we don't really have that here, but this is a source of fixing that's reasonable, that replaces itself, and you'll end up playing it in decks that are more than two colors, giving it a C. Next up, it's Scarecrow Guide, which for two generic is a 2-1 artifact creature Scarecrow at common with reach. You can pay one generic and add one mana of any color, activate only once each turn. So back-to-back -back reasonable ways to fix your mana that aren't particularly exciting, but they do do the job. I'm giving this a C. Next up, there's Soul Guide Lantern, which for one generic is an uncommon artifact. When it enters the battlefield, exile target card from a graveyard. You can tap it and sacrifice it to exile each opponent's graveyard, and you can pay one and tap it to sacrifice it to draw a card. This can hit on the graveyard pretty well, and in a pinch it can replace itself. While there is definitely some graveyard stuff going on in the format, I'm still pretty sure you don't want to main deck this. And even out of your sideboard, it doesn't seem that exciting. I'm giving it a D. Next up, it's Sir Ginger the Meal Ender, which for two generic is a 3-1 legendary artifact creature Food Knight at rare. It has Trample, Hexproof, and Haste as long as your opponent controls a Planeswalker. And whenever another artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put a plus and plus one counter on Sir Ginger and scry one. You can pay two and tap Sir Ginger to gain life equal to its power. The Planeswalker part of this card is usually irrelevant, although it is going to be pretty hilarious if it's ever active. Still, for limited, we have to ignore that part of the card more or less. 
Mostly, this is a two mana three one that can grow that also happens to be a food that also happens to like having other food and artifacts around. It works quite well with both food and bargain, which are big things in the format that can make Sir Ginger grow. And we're talking about a perfectly reasonable baseline as a two mana three one with easily accessible upside. Overall, I think that makes him a B minus. Next up, it's three bowls of porridge, which for two generic is an uncommon artifact food. You can pay two and tap it and choose one that hasn't been chosen. It can do two damage to target creature. It can tap target creature, or you can sack it to gain three. None of these modes is very efficient, but they do all do something, I guess. Picking off a small creature will probably feel the best, but sometimes tapping things is good on the right board state, especially if you have some tap payoffs. Then it can, of course, just be food. Still, the ability is expensive enough that having the mana around to actually use it is far from guaranteed. Like, you're only going to start using this in situations where you can't already add to the board, and none of these effects are going to be like, man, I'm really glad I have this mana sink. They're all very mediocre. So I think this is a D+. Plus. All right, now we're moving to land, starting with Crystal Grotto, a common land. When it enters the battlefield, you scry one, you can tap it and add colorless, or you can pay one generic and tap it to add one mana of any color. Mana filter lands that don't really do anything else aren't very good and limited. It's just really costly to have to tap two lands for one mana, and that's effectively what happens when you need to filter using Crystal Grotto. The fact that Prophetic Prism and that Scarecrow are in this set probably means that the demand for this will be even lower, as those two cards can filter your mana, and you only have to tap one land to do it, and they have more upside than Crystal Grotto does. So usually this is a D in limited, and I think the fact that we've got a prism and a scarecrow in this set probably means it drops all the way to D minus. Next up, it's edge wall in an uncommon land. It enters a battlefield tapped. When it enters a battlefield, you choose a color. It can tap to add one mana of the chosen color, and you can pay three and tap it to sacrifice it and return a card that has an adventure from your graveyard to your hand. This is a nice value land. Sure, it enters tapped, but unlike a lot of utility lands we see, this one can produce colored mana, so it isn't a liability for your mana base. And that's great, because the late game ability this has is pretty big. Getting back an adventure late is going to be something that really helps you grind out a long game, as we've seen many of them give you two for ones all on their own, and if you're getting one back like that, that's really going to turn the game around, probably in your favor. I think you're basically always going to want the first copy of this, and I'd value that first copy as a C+. Getting more than that can be a little bit of a problem, but it may turn out that there are so many good adventures you can get back in this format that it doesn't really matter that much that it enters tapped. Next up, it's Evolving Wilds. We see it all the time. Common land, tap, sacrifice, search your library for a basic land, put it on the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle. As usual, this provides nice fixing. It makes it pretty easy to splash a single card, even if you only have one Evolving Wild, since it effectively gives you two sources of your splash color. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, it's Restless Bivouac, which is a rare land that enters tapped. You can tap it for red or white, and you can pay one generic, a red and a white, and it becomes a 2-2 red and white ox creature until end of turn. It's still a land. Whenever it attacks, you put a plus and plus one counter on target creature you control. I love creature lands, and we've got a whole cycle of rare ones in this set that are really good. One of the greatest things about creature lands, especially one that gives you good fixing, like all of the ones in this cycle do, is that they become very real cards by the part of the game where you don't really need lands anymore, something that isn't true of your typical lands. This becomes an effective attacker and can even put counters on itself, and if it's left unchecked, it's definitely a land that can take over games. Worth remembering, a creature land also effectively dodges sorcery speed removal. The whole package here is really good. All of these lands, as we're going to see, that's what we have left in this video, are the five of these restless lands. They're all really good. I'm giving this one a B. Next up, it's Restless Cottage, a rare land that enters tapped, adds black or green, and you can pay two generic, a black and a green, to have it become a 4-4 black and green horror creature token until end of turn. It's still a land. And whenever it attacks, you create a food token and exile up to one target card from a graveyard. This one is a pretty beefy creature when you need it to be, and even without the attack trigger, I'd be pretty high on this card, but hating on the graveyard and getting food makes this even more amazing, giving it a B+. Next up, it's Restless Fortress, which is a rare land. It enters the battlefield tapped. It can add white or black. You can pay two generic, a white and a black, to have it become a 1-4 white and black nightmare creature token until end of turn, and whenever it attacks, defending player loses two life, and you gain two life. So a 1-4 isn't always going to get through, but this will drain two life any time it attacks, so your opponent will still usually need to alter how they are playing to account for it, and that gives you some pretty real value. I'm giving this a B. Next, there's Restless Spire, a rare land, enters tap, you can tap it for blue or red, and you can pay a blue and a red, and until end of turn it becomes a 2-1 blue and red elemental creature token with, as long as it's your turn, this creature has first strike, and whenever it attacks you scry one. 
A 2-1 with first strike can attack on many boards, and the fact that this one's so cheap to animate is pretty neat. Adding scry as the attack trigger is a nice addition. This is another B. And our last card in this cycle and our last card in this video is Restless Vine Stock, a rare land. It enters tapped. You can tap it for a green or a blue, and you can pay three generic, a green and a blue to have it become a 5-5 green and blue plant creature with trample. And whenever it attacks up to one other target creature has base power and toughness 3-3 until end of turn. So this is the beefiest of all of these, and it does not disappoint. A 5-5 Trampler is an imposing presence on virtually any board, and this can even buff one of your other creatures. It might take longer to get going than the other four, but once it does get going, it's certainly the one in the cycle that your opponent's going to be the most scared of. I'm giving it a B plus. So those are all the multicolored and colorless cards in Wilds of Eldraine. Tomorrow, I'll take a look at all the white cards. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch the rest of the review, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you're watching this after more of the set review is out, you will see a playlist on your screen shortly. Lastly, if you want to go the extra mile in supporting me and the channel while getting some set review related perks, you can become a channel member or a patron. You can find ways to do those things in the description. Thanks for watching.